Thank you, everybody. My name is Moshe Jacobson from Needworks, and uh, I'm excited to announce that my extension, Cyan Audit with a really cool logo, is ready for production now. It's been in, it's been refined over the last few years, and uh, it's an extension for in database DML logging. So any kind of inserts, updates, or deletes that you do in your database, it'll be logged into your database uh, with uh, searchability um, through a view. So with Cyan Audit, you can log all DML column by column. So you can choose which columns you want to log in your database. Um, you can search, a log, search your logs using a simple view. Uh, you just do a query, and it pulls out all your logs from as far back as you want. You can uh, configure what to log using a config table. So it's just a matter of update, update your config table, set logging as on or off for whatever columns you want to turn on or off. Uh, and the cool part about it is if you have an application uh, where your users are logging into your application and doing stuff in, and, and that stuff gets done in, in, in the database, your um, uh, Cyan Audit will actually allow you to link that operation to the application user so you can tell exactly who did every operation that happens in your database and it's great for accountability. Uh, uh, you can also uh, you can also put a label on each on each operation so that you can when you're going back through your logs you can tell where this operation happened from what exactly was going on. Uh, it's really really useful for forensics. You can also back up and restore your logs with the script. Uh, it dumps out to basically compressed CSV files. Very very space efficient. Uh, you can uh, another cron job will rotate and uh, and drop your logs after they get a, a certain age. Um, you can keep your logs on a separate, ta separate table space if you want a large, slow volume to hold your logs, whereas a, um, a fast volume will do the rest of your database. Um, and you can, you can undo your transactions, actually, which is a really cool feature of it. It's not really undoing, of course. It's just playing everything back in reverse. But it's, it's been a lifesaver for us uh, at my company. Um, many times we've done a SQL command that did something we didn't want, and then all of a sudden, it's there in the logs. You can you can just undo it, um, and uh, it's it's made to be super easy. You just install the extension, uh, you run you run a couple commands, and you're already logging everything in your database. So um, it's all written in SQL and PLPG SQL. It's all trigger based, uh, so it's not using you know it's not using any of the um, logical replication or uh, infrastructure or anything like that. It's compatible with Postgres 9.3 and newer. Um, and it's been production tested for a while now. Um, the purpose of this lightning talk is to gauge interest in this uh, as I'm trying to get this onto Amazon RDS. Uh, it's, I think, ready for, ready for prime time. And I was hoping to get a show of hands of people who might be interested in using this extension on their own application. Anybody, anybody interested in something like this? Um, what about with, is there any modifications? If you, have any, if you have any ideas of modifications that you'd like to see, raise your hand. OK, so we got a couple of people interested in this. Um, but uh, yeah, if you're, if you're interested in trying it out, I'd love your feedback. Um, we, we literally don't know how anybody else does without this at my company. We always say, I, I literally don't know how other people do it. So um, very, very uh, useful tool for us. I hope it can be a useful tool for somebody else as well. Uh, so if, if you want to download it, there's the link right there. And thank you to Needworks for sponsoring the development. if we can make the technology work eventually. Well, uh, Let's not print it. Print. OK. Uh, let's talk about elephants and raft. My name is Konstantin Pan. I'm from Postgres Professional. And uh, during our implementation of uh, multi-master and other cluster experiments, uh, we needed to, uh, to have a replicated key value storage for distributed deadlock detection and node failure detection. 
And uh, we also already had implemented uh, Raft consensus protocol in C for our distributed transaction daemon. So the idea is to uh, use Raft for replicated key value storage. Uh, this was implemented as an extension. Uh, it's available uh, over this link. Uh, to use it, you just add uh, shared preload libraries and uh, configure uh, the node number and other peers on, on each node. Uh, and call create extension uh, raftable. Uh, you can use set, get, and list uh, functions uh, in SQL and in C. And the uh, when it's running, the the processes look like this. On each node, you have multiple uh, backends, and one. Raftable worker, uh, which implements Raft protocol over UDP. And it keeps the state machine in shared memory. Uh, so when the, when a backend needs to, uh, to perform a get operation, it just looks into the shared memory. And when it uh, needs to put something new, it uh, it sends a query over TCP to, to the raftable leader and then waits until it, it gets replicated uh, at this node. We need to do some more testing and implement node management in Raft. That's all. Really fuzzy. Well, it's slightly out of focus. <laughs> oh, ah, that's better. <coughs> Hello, um, my name's Dave. Um, I've been working on PG Admin for nearly 20 years now, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, who's used PG Admin 3? Quick show of hands, very fast. I'm on the clock here. I haven't got time to mess around. Who's used PG Admin 2? A few people, and um, what about the original PG Admin? Well, PG Admin, nothing. <laughs> All right, for the uh, the last six months or so, we've been working on PG Admin Four. Woohoo! Woo yeah. <laughs> PG Admin Four is a complete rewrite of PG Admin Three. Um, well, it's just a rewrite in general. Um, and if Greg's computer will actually change, what am I supposed to press? Space arrow. I, yeah, I pressed that. Nothing happened. Really? Really. Ooh, technology. <laughs> take down! Take down! Oh, no. Oh, oh is it? Why oh. is it in continuous mode? Uh, I don't know. Try that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what is can, can we stop the clock? No, no, you get to I, I'm feeling hard done by here. All right, so PG Admin 4, if we can ever show you any of it, um, has been designed as a web application. Well, then it cut off the bottom was the problem. Well, I don't know, it's close enough. It is. But it still won't show the next page. There you go, display that page. Uh, so we built it as a web application, backends written in Python. Uh, you missed all my good slides. That's the only problem. <laughs> I even put a cat slide in there because somebody told me you needed a cat in a presentation like this. Oh, we're working now. It says loading. I'm going home. <laughs> 
All right, so it's been designed as a web application, written in Python on the back end, mostly JavaScript oh, and jQuery on the front end. Um, pretty big, they're photos. Um, uh, we've designed it so that you can run it on a web server in the cloud, managing all your servers, or we've got a runtime desktop application that will allow it to run basically standalone, much as you'd run with PG Admin 3 right now. We have all the things that you used to seeing before. Oh, we were actually. Yeah, it's working. Uh, you, did you ignore the picture of the cat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, well, that's the problem. That's yeah, the so, problem. So you're not supposed to have a cat. Those are the ones. All right, so we got a few dashboards in there. I mean, you can tell that looks very different from PG Admin 3. We actually stuck with the tree view, which is one of the few things that does look kind of similar. We looked at various different ways of navigating around the database structure, and frankly, the tree view is about the only way that really seems to work and not feel contrived and just yeah. Um So we added some dashboards to give you something interesting to look at, some little uh, graphs and things to show you what your database server's doing. Obviously, you can look at object properties. It's all prettified compared to how it used to be. Uh, we're still working on final touches here, so there's going to be tweaks and improvements over the next few uh, few weeks. You can edit objects. Now all of this is responsive, so if you go on a smaller screen it will rewrap and do all the things you'd expect when you try and run it on your iPhone. If anyone does try and run it on your iPhone, then don't come running to me if you have problems. It's just ridiculous trying to design a database like that. <laughs> we have a query tool. Uh, PG Admin 3 has a separate query tool and data editor. You know, you'd right click on a table and uh, get up a, a, a separate data editor. Well, we've merged those into one in this tool, so you can run a query in it, you can edit the data down below. Uh, we're gonna make it smarter and smarter. Right now, the first version, it depends how you launch it as to whether it will let you edit the data, uh, but we're putting smarts in there so that it will understand and try and figure out whether the query you've hand typed is something that we can sensibly try and update. And we're doing for time. Tell me I'll get an extra minute, please. Yes. Um, you already got the extra minute. Uh, query plan visualization. Um, there's more improvements coming on that. Procedural language debugger. Maintenance tools. We're doing backup and so on. Alpha release is coming soon. PG Admin Hackers at PostgreSQL.org if you want to take a look. Uh, or you can check out the code from the uh, git.postgresql.org right now and have a play with it. But look out for it. Be with you probably around the time of 9-6. Finally, who likes Europe? <laughs> Yay. Um, so as you may know, Magnus and I and various other people that are here at the moment um, organize this little tiny conference every year. Um, we're doing our eighth one in Tallinn, Estonia, November 1st to 4th. It's really warm at that time of year. You'll love it. Um, take a look at the website. We'd love to have you come join us. Thank you. Okay, let's see if the next set of slides work better. You must have taken a really high res photo. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I wanna talk here about several uh, patches and extensions that we did in Postgres Pro last year, and that dealing with uh, distributing transaction and helping to create distributed database out of the Postgres. So basically about two things. That uh, one thing we call distributed transaction manager. And second one, how we can achieve multi-master replication with the first thing. Uh, so distributed transaction manager, uh, it's a communication protocol uh, along with some algorithms that uh, allow us to achieve distributed, consist, uh, distributed isolation and distributed transaction between different nodes. So we can set up several nodes and run transactions uh, that spans uh, to two nodes, for example. 
So talking about Postgres, we created small patch that exposes several internal routines about visibility and C log access and implemented an extension that uh, allows, to allows us to create uh, distributed transactions. And we done several integrations with Postgres FDW and PG Shard. And also it can be used in application-based sharding. So you can actually run start transaction on one node, on different node, call, ro call routines on that node, that can, and that will promote uh, transaction as a global one. So let's see some example based on FDW. So uh, suppose we have simple uh, bank uh, test. So there is a table with a user ID and amount of money. And we have two different installations, shard one and shard two with local tables that create, that have uh, user accounts. And we have third node that uh, create like FDV connection to both of that nodes and runs following transaction on the table. That on the third node, table T is empty on that node, but it can look to the two shards, and we start transferring money, and actually it can be done, can users can uh, live on different nodes, and parallelly execute uh, some of all accounts. Since there is a transaction, we expect that uh, some will be constant all the time, but actually no any transactional information pushed down through a Postgres FDW by default. So it's extreme bench and it's one of the tools that we are using in our testing. It actually implements following transaction concurrently. And total is that uh, result that uh, summarizing transaction get. Uh, so it's fluctuating. It's uh, actually violates repeatable reads. So it sees intermediate states inside the transaction. And we can uh, use our extension, pgtsdtm times stand distribute transaction manager, create extension. It will run a background worker that can talk with, the with a such background worker on a different node. And after that, uh, there, there will be proper transaction isolation. And out of that, we can build a multi-master. So it's built on top of logical it wraps uh, update and selects as a global transactions uh, we do a concurrent application of uh, transactions that replicated so if you have several big transactions they will be uh, applied uh, concurrently and also that Constantine talked about we use raft based storage for a log detection and dealing with failures so our implementation right now it's uh, about a half of speed of standalone Postgres for writes and the same speed for reads. Uh, it can uh, recover from uh, node failure. So node can, for example, go and reboot. And after it will uh, be available again, it will kind of replicate, replicate changes. And cluster will be available for writes when majority is online. Uh, also, it can deal with network partition, and we are working on that right now. And can work as an extension if that XTM API will go into core, or we will merge some, or we'll just merge one implementation of uh, DTM into core. So, thank you. I think that was the best timing so far with nine seconds to go. I mean, Dave would obviously be better if it wasn't for the slides, but you know, beyond that, that's excellent timing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Who wishes that Dave's cat would have been? Okay. okay, so the cat is now up on Twitter. Is it right Anyone's right interested right in the missing yeah. slide? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Thomas Munro. I, I work for Enterprise DB. Um, unlike everyone else who's spoken, I'm going to be talking about some software that doesn't exist, um, and specifically about a, a, a SQL standard feature that I think is really interesting and that we don't have. In fact, no one has. Um, first of all, I'm going to travel back in time with my time machine to sometime in the mid-90s um, when I was out of straight out of university and my first job. I came across a, a client that had a non-relational data store, and they had 
lots of objects, um, except more than like millions and millions of things. And, and um, these things were all connected to each other with these pointers, and, and there were these back pointers. So you could navigate from a, an asset to a site, and from a site back to all the assets. So that's whatever, you know, you could navigate around this graph. But the forward pointers and back pointers were kind of linked to each other. Um, that sounds like it should work just fine, right? I mean, if you're going to update things, you've just got to lock the right objects and move these pointers around, and everything should be perfectly consistent at all times. Um, so let's get some concurrency happening. And uh, hang on a second, what's happened here? Um, now we've got some pointers to some things that are gone, and some forward pointers and back pointers that are mixed up. Um, yeah, something's gone wrong here. So this is real. This is you know an experience I, I had, and uh, and so a, a, a group of us were asked to come in, you know. Um, and figure out how we were going to find out what's gone wrong with this data. And see, so the idea was to, to, get a, to, 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 to build a report that would figure out which two-way pointers were not in sync. And um, after an initial phase of doing these reports, just write some software that would figure out which pointer was missing. And it must be pretty obvious how to fix it, right? Um, so I, I fondly think back to that time, it was the eventual constraints team, because that's kind of the thing that was missing from that system, and the thing that in the universe that we live in, um, we have obviously traveling back in time now to the 1970s, all this great relational data bank stuff, um, which um, Ted Codd and a bunch of others uh, gave us, uh, so that we don't have problems like that, right? We have these things called constraints, this unique constraints, that's foreign key constraints, that's specifically the thing that would deal with that problem. And then there's these check constraints that can, you know, impose some kind of constraint on the rows in your tables. But wait, there's more. The SQL standard says that you can do stuff like this. You can say there should be no more than 15 students in any given class. And there, there's a check constraint attached to a table that says, you, you know, this count star shouldn't give more than 15. Now, we can't actually do that. Um, but you're mine. We can't do that because... Um, that contains a subquery, and that's what Postgres will tell you. But in fact, no existing RDBMS does that. Um, now, there are a couple of RDBM RDBMSs that will accept that, but they don't actually work. They just run the check when you insert something, but they don't check all the reference data, and that's, of course, the hard bit. Um, second, the, the, the other thing which is really difficult about it is dealing with concurrency. Now, you might think that serializable could help you with that, but generally speaking, people are afraid of serializable. Or in, and in most databases, it doesn't even work properly, right? Um, <coughs> OK, so here's the crazy idea. We could think really hard and f make an analyzer that can efficiently figure out which constraints need to be checked. Now, that's difficult, and I haven't got time to explain why, but it could be done. And note that the same kind of analysis is going to be needed for materialized views. We get to doing incremental or materialized view methods. Then if you required serializable um, isolation for any DML which is touching something that's referenced by one of these checks, you could have a scenario like this. You know, you come along and try and access this enrollment table and insert another st a student, and it just tells you, go away, you're not running a serializable. I, I can't actually run the checks required for this update. So you run the same thing as serializable, and, and now it can reject it. You're trying to put too many students in there, and the check said, you know, you can only have 15 that's going to run that count. That's something we can't do today, but if we did that, it would be, we would be the first database to have that, and, you know, it's something that's been in the SQL standard since 1992, and it's a kind of consistency that people actually ask for quite often, I find. People who are new to using databases <laughs> expect to be able to do that sort of thing. Here, yeah, and um, actually, most people can express this kind of stuff quite easily. They, you know, it's just SQL, right? Um, <clears throat> so we might actually be the only RDBMS that could actually implement this and get it working because we have our amazing SSI system. Okay. That's me. I'm done. Sure there's a better way, but this works. Uh, oh, there it is. Hiding way over there. <coughs> okay. Uh. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Satoshi Nagayasu. I came from Japan. Uh, as some of you may remember, uh, I gave a pitch at the last PGCon, uh, which was the first plan of PGD Asia. 
uh, do you remember? Uh, then one year passed, so it's time to uh, share some updates about the conference with you. Uh, in the last mark, uh, this is my uh, last uh, pitch. Uh, in the last March, we made the first Pan-Asian uh, Postgres Conference in Singapore. Uh, the PGD Asia 2016 was held on March uh, 17th and 19th uh, with, as a joint e effort with Force Asia 2016. Actually, uh, PGD Asia was, uh, uh, it has uh, 90 uh, people, uh, speakers, uh, 90 uh, regular sessions and writing talks as usual, and also uh, 100 attendees. Uh, at that conference, uh, Bruce gave the keynote, uh, did he uh, give a uh, post 9.6 performance talk, uh, Sawada-san uh, introduced the uh, backend freezing map, and uh, also uh, Umar uh, talked about big data and Postgres. <laughs> and also Iria came to Singapore, and other Japanese uh, new guy uh, introduced uh, migration technology from Oracle. And of course, many other great talks there. I would like to sh uh, show some pictures about uh, the conference. Uh, this is a uh, happy anniversary, uh, 20 years anniversary uh, study at the Singapore. And reception, uh, Bruce keynote, keynote, and talks, and attendees, and uh, talks, and meetups, and many people. Uh, this is group shot from uh, day one. Uh, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, the PGD Asia is the, uh, was the joint uh, effort with Force Asia. So this is a picture from day two, uh, the PGD uh, Asia day two, and also uh, Force Asia day two. So uh, there are many uh, talks out there, and uh, many people enjoyed both the Postgres conference and. Uh, Force Asia at, at the same time. So, okay, uh, ah, this is a picture from uh, Force Asia day two. So, okay, it's uh, time to think of the next uh, event. Uh, the next plan has not fixed yet, but PGD Asia day, uh, 2017 uh, will be held on in the same format in the same season and same region. So please uh, do not uh, miss the next one if you are interested in coming to Asia. So, and if you are interested in coming to Singapore, please let me know and let's keep in touch. Okay, it's my, uh, my time is over and it's next is Mikhail's turn. So. How long do I have? Uh, uh, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. So how long do I have? One minute? Two minutes. Oh, do you reset the timer? So, step on? Yeah. It's uh, still the same talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I guess you how, have another how long five do minutes. I have? One, two Stop minutes? Something like that. Two minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm joking. Uh, like, I don't have much to say. Uh, just, you, you already know where you are going at the beginning of September. You will be in Estonia. Then you will go but to. I would recommend beginning of November. Well, uh, November, sorry, sorry. You want to conference. Sorry, sorry. Uh, after that, you will be in California. And here is a new conference that will happen at the end of November, which is in Asia. PGConf Asia 2016, uh, the first one of its name. It's going to be here. Actually, it's going to be close to here. <laughs> Uh, this is going to be in Tokyo, Akihabara. <laughs> and uh, Akihabara is known for that also. Uh, so there will be a lot of people there, and it is aimed at becoming the biggest conference in Asia uh, for PostgreSQL. So people would like to do some developer meeting. There would be some business community track. And there's go going also to be a call for paper that whose announce should be in July. Uh, there is a dedicated, a dedicated team to that, and there is also a website, which is up. So, welcome to Japan. That's all.
Hi, my name is Konstantin Knizhnik. I am working for Port Zivis Professional, but now I want to present the result of uh, yet another Russian team uh, from Inst Institute of System Programming of Russian Academy of Science. They have a uh, huge experience in dynamic uh, code generation and uh, then want to apply this experience to improve speed of Postgres. Uh, they are using LLVM JIT, uh, which is uh, de facto standard now for dynamic code generation. It is used in a large number of products. If you are developing your own programming language or speeding up uh, existing one, then uh, LLVM is for you. Um, so try to <laughs> <laughs> marry <laughs> uh, LLVM with Postgres and uh, see results. Um, this is Postgres uh, query execution plan. And uh, at the right, you see result of uh, LLVM bit code produced uh, corresponding to this uh, query execution plan. Uh, for example, in this uh, query, you can see that 50% uh, of time is spent in uh, exact qual, which evaluates expression, and uh, using LVM allows to reduce it to 6% and almost uh, speed up this query about two times. Um, certainly, it is not the first attempt to use uh, dynamic code generation uh, for Postgres. The same thing was done in Vitesse DB, but uh, it is commercial product and not open source. And uh, these guys are going to publish the result of their work in open source. There is uh, one major difference in approach used uh, in the Vitesse DB and uh, uh, Institute of System Programming. Uh, Postgres uh, contains about 2,000 uh, operators. Uh, the first, uh, then the, the most straightforward approach is to just manually rewrite them using LLVM. But it uh, requires a large, a huge amount of work, and uh, academic people prefer to solve more generic tasks instead of do, uh, doing such <laughs> uh, <laughs> stupid work. Uh, so them uh, develop converter, which um, allows to um, uh, automatically convert these methods to LLVM code. The first step of this conversion uses standard CLANG compiler, which produces LLVM bit code. Then converter uh, generates C++ code, which um, <laughs> generates LLVM code. <laughs> 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 and uh, finally, them get uh, complete tree which evaluates uh, query. This is uh, once again result of generation uh, LVM bit code for Postgres uh, query execution plan. Um, here is the first query of the PCH. You can see that uh, aggregation takes about 75% and uh, quite complex expressions are used in uh, aggregations and using JIT allows to significantly speed up execution of this query. <laughs> they get right now three times uh, improve, improvement at uh, this query, but it's uh, just first attempt and then expect uh, much more uh, speed up. But uh, using JIT is not uh, the only optimization they have implemented. Another useful thing is replacing pool model with push style. It allows, uh, according to their results, it allows to reach about 25% uh, of uh, speed up of uh, query execution. Uh, them have manually converted most of Postgres uh, SQL nodes. Not all nodes are currently converted. For example, bitmap heap scan not currently converted. Uh, most of speed up is achieved at first query but uh, I expect that, uh, for example, uh, Q6 also will be significantly improved once they have implemented bitmap heap scan. Uh, 
So conclusions, I have done a lot of work in a quite small amount of time because this work was started just so in this year. So now we all learn what the lightning talk is, right? I'm sorry, you're out of time. Yeah. You'd think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name's uh, Michael Richardson. I live in Ottawa, and um, I'm a I'm a Postgres um, user. Um, so uh, I'll actually just start by saying thank you to all of you because I don't think I sometimes I don't even know what version of Postgres I'm using. Um, but two days a week I spend uh, working for a small ISP in Montreal that is in the business to business ISP space. And um, they do mostly do VoIP. Uh, we pull in about 100,000 CDR records per day into a system that the clients can then argue about which one was a long distance call and which one wasn't, and uh, things like that. And um, like most small ISPs with people that aren't really have a lot of experience, they it takes them a while to learn that they might need to have a ticket system or a customer relationship management system, but they always know from the very beginning they need a billing system. That's a critical thing. And so that's the legacy code that we wrote and we've been maintaining for several years and they suddenly decided, gee, it would be nice if we could like, you know, have the same list of customers everywhere. And so they uh, actually, after installing some things, decided they would like Sweet CRM and OTRS, which is written in Perl. And uh, so that was the goal. Take a list of clients from Sweet CRM, um, which you know should get billed and things like this. Um, be able to open tickets against those customers with OTRS, which is written Sweet CRM is written in PHP, as I recall. And uh, we learned later on that it only speaks MySQL. Um, and uh, ticket sync system OTRS written in Perl uh, doesn't use Catalyst. Um, some stuff. It's been around for a long time. And then we have our, our system that keeps track of all the assets for the client, um, all the telephones, which telephones belong to which customers, which customers have which buildings, which buildings are hooked up by which piece of fiber, um, and who's going to lose service when a particular piece of fiber gets cut or maintained or something like that. Um, and so that was it. So we, w this diagram you see, I'll show you it again, and, and we needed to put it all together. I talked all about that. Uh, fundamentally, the key piece of information that we wanted to start with was list of customers. Turns out that that's not a well-defined list because different people and different billing systems have different lists of customers and, and we don't actually, to this date, have a definitive list at this point, but we're hoping soon, maybe, uh, and the duplicates and the other stuff. So, Sweet CR so we had OTRS and it likes its own schema and its own list of customers and we had sweet CRM, and so the simple was, well, let's throw some views at the problem, and, you know, that worked really well, um, and it was really great, and then we moved on to sweet CRM, and I'm like, wait a minute, why is the configuration option to make it do my Postgres? And then, it, it, then I read the documentation again and realized it wasn't. So, um, foreign data wrappers to the rescue with 9.5, and isn't that great? And it worked great. It really worked great until we tried to install, insert a new customer. So it works great, you know, a sales guy can insert a new customer in, this, in the CRM and blah, 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 and he can pass it on to the operations guy who opens a ticket against this customer and the data all updates and everything's great. And then I want to do some work where I insert those missing customers from this other system using a Rails framework, and it blows up. Um, so it turns out that foreign data wrappers can't really handle uh, at least the MySQL one, not surprisingly, can't really handle returning. And Rails quite intelligently uses Postgres and says, hey, insert this data and now return the ID of the new inserted data. And MySQL can't do that, so it fails. The other thing that we discovered was that M Rails, along with uh, things like Django and Catalyst and D or DBI, uh, DBI in Perl, would like to introspect the database and find out the list of, of of tables and the fields in them. Foreign data wrappers aren't in the PG catalog because they're not really there. 
So it didn't get quite in the right place. So the right thing, everything solved with layer of indirection. So we created a view, which was, you can see on the right, which was select star from this other thing. And lo and behold, we had a real table, or sort of one. Um, and that's the end. That's the diagram. The green stuff is the stuff that's outside. And then we had all these views and stuff that go back and forth. And everything worked relatively well. So thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Alexander Kratkov. I'd like to uh, present uh, a short announce of PG Passman, uh, which is extension for PostgreSQL partitioning. And the uh, uh, idea of this extension is to address uh, some of uh, problems of constraint exclusion mechanism. Uh, we call this, uh, call this extension PG uh, Passman. Uh, because this extension uh, became possible because uh, Postgres have a pass list hook. Uh, and uh, then we be able to generate uh, custom pass list. And uh, uh, thanks to this, we was be able to do it faster and uh, better. So in particular, the uh, restrictions we want to work around is at first very slow query planning with large number of partitions uh, because constraints exclusion just iterate over each of partition during planning of uh, each query. And uh, with large number of partitions, it's, it's very slow. It could be, if your query is simple, it could be much slower than actually query execution. Uh, another uh, limitation of exclusion constraint mechanism is that uh, query conditions are pushed as is into partitions without any simplification. Uh, this is not an error, but uh, something which is nice to optimize. Also, constraint exclusion supports only some of uh, partitioning types. Uh, this could be improved. For instance, a hash partition could be supported. And uh, another thing is runtime partition selection. I will show you this on example. Uh, what PG Passman do better, it do fast partition selection, better filter condition processing, runtime partition selection, and also supports hash partitioning. Uh, this is kind of stress test uh, with uh, uh, 365 uh, partitions, so it's year partition by date, and uh, uh, results are TPS, so higher is better, and uh, single table is uh, uh, blue, PG Passman is yellow, and, and Partman is uh, red. Uh, so, uh, uh, planning of queries is uh, much, much faster with PG Passman. It's uh, almost uh, as fast as a uh, single table. Uh, there is a stress test uh, of for partitioning where all accesses was randomized. Then we, it's not surprising we not uh, see uh, the win of partitioning over single table here, but we see that there is no, no such huge regression. And another thing is uh, simplification of filter conditions. Uh, you can see that in const constraints exclusion doesn't simplify anything. Uh, every condition is pushed down to a particular partition, even if it's always true or always false. Uh, PG Passman automatically simplifies uh, such conditions, and uh, as a result, it could, uh, better plans could be selected. For instance, uh, sequential scan could be selected uh, instead of index scan, or uh, index scan could be selected uh, instead of uh, uh, composition of bitmap scans, which is uh, much faster. Uh, Another thing is uh, that uh, runtime partition selection, uh, for instance, it's uh, very useful uh, for nested loop joins. Uh, there is a join uh, without uh, runtime uh, partition selection. Uh, hash join was selected because nested loop uh, became 
too much, uh, too, too slow uh, with uh, this number of partitions. And uh, if we use runtime append, uh, it becomes uh, many times faster, uh, more than uh, 20 times. Uh, we can, uh, there is a custom node, uh, thanks to custom nodes uh, mechanism in Postgres. Uh, this runtime append node uh, selects which table to scan depending on parameters and scan only that table. Uh, so uh, it's available on GitHub. It's currently beta, uh, not for production used, but every testing is welcome. I will publish news on my blog, and that's all. <laughs> Okay, we have a new record for best timing. That was with one second to spare. <laughs> Let's see if someone can top that. We have fractions in here, but um, I think we do. Yeah, we do have fractions in the display, so. Hi, um, I'm Greg Stark. Um, Usually, most usually at these conferences, there's a presentation usually by um, a Swede standing over there uh, called "Look at the Elephant's Trunk" with the new features coming out. So I thought after 20 years, it would be worth having one call um, uh, a quick look at the elephant's tail and see where we've come from. Um, so um, I prepared a presentation for a different conference called "Sorting Through the Ages," where I benchmarked Postgres, um, compiling old versions of Postgres. Uh, going back as far as 7.3, in fact, um, almost 7.2. Um, and these are running, th th these benchmarks are running um, a handful of queries. They're all sort, they're all queries that benchmark the sorting code. And the talk focused on that. Um, but right now, I'm not going to talk so much about the sorting code and the performance, uh, but about how I did this, because this turned out to be a much longer journey than I expected. Uh, so one thing to, to, to make clear here is I compiled not just the major releases, but there's about 180 data points there for each of these lines. So I did git checkouts of the development versions um, uh, about every four to six weeks, and sometimes a bit denser because around the changes. Um, it turns out, uh, and, and the further back you go, even, even on the recent releases, that, that was not always so simple because there was Obviously, Git checkouts could include bugs or uh, development compilation problems. Uh, but the further back you went, there were the more and more problems I had. Um, so these are, this is what the benchmarks actually looked like. So it was a, um, it's basically a CSV file that I, that my script, um, so I, I ran PSQL, parsed the results in Perl, and generated the CSV. So it's a few different queries. The timing from PSQL backslash timing, which itself is a bit of a trick because that was a feature that was added at a certain point. Um, so I wanted to be used the same. I wanted to use modern tools, not not check out, not install old Debian packages and run that because I wanted to see how the performance had changed over time of our code, not how the performance, uh, the, the effectiveness of GCC had changed. Um, so I chose dash capital O2, but I had to add some options from modern compilations. Uh, like dash f wrap v uh, that weren't in the old ones. I set some some of the parameters to be the same, and I used Ukrainian because I was sorting. Uh, I wanted to test the sorting code, um, and I ended up with a script that looks something like this. It had a huge list of Git re uh, revision IDs and checked out each one, built it. Uh, it did a Git checkout, built uh, Git clean, did a configure. Um, I, it's a bit of a trick here. No, on the next one, I guess. So I export C flags, set all those um, those options. Some of those are to disable optimizations in GCC that don't work on our older source code. There was various um, uh, gotchas I got. I actually had to. There, um, I have to have different branches in the script to handle older versions where the configure script wasn't a configure script, but was actually. Uh, didn't recognize uh, Linux 64. That, that was something that it hadn't ever heard of. And then I ended up with a collection of patches. Uh, here, here's, uh, I think this is, no, this is from the script. So this is all the, so the, here it's applying some patches. It just tries to apply them all and see, sees what, it, it does, ignores fa patch failures. Um, and then here's a collection of random 
things I had to fix to get all these old versions to compile. Uh, Bison was a, was a headache. It seems uh, Bison changed its API, its, its interface quite a, uh, quite a few times over the times. ECPG, we never kept in sync properly, and Bison start, started being much more picky about um, duplicate tokens and things, so I actually wrote a script to resync. Anyways, um, so I, I'm running out of time. That's why I'm skipping some things. So said Bison Perl, um, Perl. Um, it turns out Perl 5.10, according to our old configure scripts, is too old because we need at least 5.3. <laughs> um, read line changes interface. Libc changed um, some behavior with signal handling. Um, uh, before seven point, the, 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 I stopped going, uh, compiling older versions when it uh, no longer supported 64-bit machines. I actually got 60.5 to compile, but it didn't run. Um, and I, I learned some interesting things. There were some interesting decisions. I, I, I should have saved more time for this, where um, I discovered things that failed that didn't fail at the time because we fixed it before it actually ran into, before the GCC actually started being uh, complaining of or, or causing problems. So there were some in, uh, good decisions made that avoided problems in our past. Um, Sorry, Greg. Yeah. Well, that, oh, man. <laughs> so you don't win the award. No, eh? <laughs> not, not, not quite. No, it's about <laughs> 10 minutes. All right, well, my name is Serge Rila. I work for Salesforce. I'm a pretty much of a Postgres newbie, only with like one year of track record. And before that, I was a developer in uh, DB2 LUW. Uh, so title is uh, Backend Size Matters. Um, some stats about uh, the system I'm working on. Uh, we are having about somewhere in excess of 30,000 PLPG SQL functions, uh, over 1,000 tables over 2,000 PLPG SQL triggers, and then there's types, indices, views, you name it. And the system should be running with around 200 connections when it's under full load. And uh, all this is a 3T architecture uh, where the client sessions do not have an affinity to any specific backend session. So basically any transactions can go to any backend. Okay, so we're just spraying it around. Um, so. When you, when you have a system like this, really some interesting things happen. Uh, and, and the result of these interesting things are a lot of FUD. So the first thing we heard was the database is leaking memory like a sieve. And because it's leaking memory like a sieve, the application server has to recycle connections every 100 transactions. Uh, but that really shouldn't be the problem because recycling connections don't really cost anything, right? So that, that's what I kind of like heard when I joined. <laughs> Said, well, I, I don't really think that's true. So let's go to the facts. The facts are that with the frequent recycling of the backend that was enforced from the application, we found that about a third of the time we spent was just compiling queries and compiling PLPG, parsing PLPG SQL uh, functions and so on and so forth. So, so pretty, pretty nasty overhead. Uh, not something we wanted to do. However, if we would switch off backend recycling, then we would end up with 140 megabyte catalog cache, 550 megabytes PLPG SQL and embedded SQL cache, so basically the SQL within the PLPG SQL, uh, and that is you assuming uh, you basically reach a hot set of about 2,000 of these functions, so not all 30,000 in there, and, and then 50 megabytes of others. So you multiply that with 200 backends, and you end up with about 150 gigabytes space requirements just for your backend. I'd rather have that in my buffer pool. So uh, that, that clearly is not something that we think we, we will eventually use, so we have to work on that. So I did some measurements. This is actually already a measurement where I had a little bit of trying to do some controls on this. 
Um, so you see at the bottom, actually, these are things like transactions and executor allocated types. That's all reasonably kind of like goes up in town and doesn't really get more than 20 megabytes each. Um, you see the purple line that goes all the way to the top and the end is the, um, that's the catalog cache between the rel cache and the regular catalog cache, which is uh, about 160. Um, uh, I, and then you see other things like the orange and the whatever rusty red together. This is a PLPG SQL and the other one. So it, it adds up. So next thing we did was, okay, let's just tackle this. So good news. If you take, you take a look at this thing, it kind of like comes like this, and it goes algorithmic, right? So, it, so, so to, I mean, it goes, it goes uh, towards some asymptotic max value. So it's not actually leaking. It's just bloating. Lots of bloat. So the first thing I did when I joined was uh, I limited the PLPG SQL function cache. So there is an existing cache. It just doesn't have an LRU with it. It just keeps growing. So, so, so I put a max on that thing with an LRU and eviction, uh, fixed some other issues that were inherent. Um, and then I was able to reduce the cache by half and still get very good hit ratios. So I put it like to 2,000 functions that allow in and go from there. Um, so I limited the catalog cache uh, to about 120 megabytes, what was originally, and I get it down to about 25. That's about with 10,000 entries, and it cut it down by three. Um, then we did some changes to uh, the way how custom and generic plans work. We actually compare not just custom plan cost, we also checking out uh, the shape of the plan using a plan ID. And then if the plan ID doesn't change between custom plans, we switch over to generic plans. Um, and then I added a plan source cache for dynamic SQL that's not prepared by comparing statement titles. So with all that, I was able to do a memory estimator and I can now control with GUX the size of this thing and then uh, basically predict how good, good it goes. So with, uh, this ran, with this default values here with 200 connections, I would go to about 90 gigabytes, which is still too much. So food for thought in the last 20 seconds. Uh, so due to the spraying, all of our backends pretty much hold the same stuff because there's no affinity. So any improvement I can do on the, on the backend will only give me incremental savings. But if I were to have shared caches, I could drop the footprint by 100x, right? So, and that's it, and I have two seconds. Thank you.